Even though our lives are uncertain, he still holds our world in his hands. And that is today's Morning Moxie. Welcome to the Morning Moxie show. I am your host, Alicia Sharp, and today we have Andy Stanley joining us, and he is talking about basically just how God is still on the throne, and no matter what we go through, we are still in the palm of his hands, and sometimes it's hard to remember that when we're going through a hard time, when things aren't looking the way that we think they should look in our lives, God is still on the throne, and he's still holding us. And we have got to just learn to trust him. Here's Andy. And never has there been a time as a pastor or church leader that I've wanted to figure out faster or quicker how we could do practical things to help people more. But here's what I know, because this is our message. That although that idea, that insight, that that truth about the scripture doesn't change anything in our circumstances, here's what it does. It allows you to embrace uncertainty with the certainty of knowing that God is still in control. That although life is uncertain, God is not uncertain. Although life is uncertain and family is uncertain and the economy is uncertain and the world seems to be uncertain, God is not uncertain. He still has the whole world in his hands. And this knowledge and embracing it, even if it's just with our fingernails holding on, it allows us not, it keeps us from making decisions that even further complicate the difficulties that we're facing. It allows you to go to bed at night and as we'll talk about in a couple of weeks, discover that there is, there is, there is a way to have peace even in the midst of this storm. It will teach us to keep an eye out for the activity of God that may take us by surprise as it often took the characters of scripture by surprise, to hang on to and to embrace the simple truth that even though life is uncertain, God is not uncertain. And he still has the whole world. He still has your entire world in his hands. Now, that's easy for me to sit up here and say because I don't have to walk up out the door and get in your car and go back to your home or go back to your circumstances I don't have to get up tomorrow morning like I know many in our congregation are doing and wonder, what am I going to do today? I don't have to go home and figure out how am I going to stay in school. I realize our circumstances are all very different. And what gives me the nerve to sit up here and try to encourage you? Am I painting a picture of, you know, pie in the sky, by and by? Is this just kind of a pep talk so that you'll go out and maintain faith? Is this this just what the preacher is supposed to say? I understand all that. And especially if you're new to faith, or you've been burned by the church before, or you have a bad negative experience, or you watched a parent go through a difficult, difficult, difficult time, and the church just kept sort of, you know, pumping all this sweet, nice message out to your parents, and you never saw it take hold, and you never saw it make a difference. I understand that. But here's what I'd say. The foundation of my message today is this, not my life. But I recently ran into a guy that gave me the extraordinary courage I would need to bring these next three messages to you. I want to tell you a story real quick. When Sandra and I um, were in Washington, D.C. for the National Prayer Service, and I think this will be the last time I bring it up, I promise. This won't be the perpetual sermon illustration, okay? There were only three remarkable things about that, and this is the second one. I'm not sure the third one will ever be shared. But we um, had been told that we were going to have an opportunity to meet the president, Barack Obama. And so they took us to the basement of the National Cathedral, which was a giant room, sort of a big wide hall, And they said we were to wait there. And we were down there about 30 minutes waiting. And they lined us up in order that we were to meet the president because somebody was going to read a list of names so he would hear our names and we'd be in the right order. So they put us in order, but we weren't standing in line. We were just spread out down this wide hall. And at the end of the hall were four steps and then a hallway and and it dead ended into this wall and then a hallway cut this way. And so the president was going to come around this corner and was going to greet us. He's going to be at the top of these four stairs, four or five stairs. And as it turned out, I was in line behind a gentleman that I just met named Reverend Otis Moss. Reverend Otis Moss. Reverend Moss was born in 1935. He was an African-American born in middle Georgia in 1935. When he was 16 years old, he was orphaned. I do not and have not been able to find out the circumstances of that, but he lost both parents. So he was a 16-year-old African-American male in middle Georgia in 1951 and saw the worst that this country has had to offer in a long, long time. 
And yet at 19 years old, while he was still a teenager, put his faith in Christ actually earlier than that. But at 19 years old, decided he wanted to go into the ministry and be a preacher. And through the years, he was able to connect with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He marched with him in Selma. He marched with him in Washington, D.C. Became a part of that, that core group of men and women that experienced things that hopefully nobody in this country will ever have to experience again. He experienced the loss of a friend. He, he experienced the division of family. He experienced hate, racism and hatred that we, for most of us, we can't even imagine. And yet through all of that time, he maintained his faith. And as he was sharing this with me, because I'd never met him personally before, he had his back to the stairs where the president was to come in. And I'm just asking as many questions I can and trying to be as quiet as I can just to listen to this man. And as he shared these stories and conversations with Coretta Scott King, and just, uh, just unbelievable history right there in front of me, in the middle of a sentence, he just stopped and this sounds so much like a preacher story, but I promise this is exactly how it happened. He just stopped talking to me and he turned and just kind of stared off into space. And here's what he said. And we know, I mean, just out of the blue. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. And he just stopped. He quoted the first half of Romans 8, 28. And we know, just, I mean, he wasn't, he was telling me a story. And we know that, in, and he says it, I don't want to try to imitate his awesome black preacher voice. And we know that in all things, and I'm thinking, yeah, and you have seen some all things. The all things that fall into your all things are nothing like the things that have fallen into my all things. The all things that he has experienced are much different than the all things that many of us have experienced or will ever experience. And we know that in all things, God works. And we know that in all things, God works to the benefit of those who love him. And I'm standing there real quiet. And then he turned back to me and he said, but Pastor Stanley, sometimes it takes him a while. And that's when I just had, I just lost it. I thought, oh my gosh. And sometimes, but sometimes, it takes him a while. And then behind him, I saw the Secret Service stand up straight and turn, and there was movement. And around the corner comes the first African-American president of the United States of America. And Reverend Moss turned around, and I'm thinking, oh my gosh. I, I can't even begin to understand or appreciate the gravity or the significance of this moment. And he went forward and shook the president's hand. And, and I thought to myself, I'm about to meet a president, but I've just had a conversation with a saint. I've had a conversation with a man who understands in a way that I will never understand, in a way that most of us will never understand, but in a way that we all need to understand. That when life is uncertain, God is not. And he still has the whole world in his hands. And he still has your world and your family in his hands. And he still has your world and your family in his hands. And he still has your personal finances and all the things that are worrying us to death and the reality of that in his hands. And I had just met a man who maintained faith through things I can't even imagine. And here he is in his mid-70s, who's able to say with absolute confidence that our God works, is active, is present, is evident in all things, fill in the blank any way you want to, for those who love him. And he didn't finish the verse, and who are called according to his my friends, I don't know what the future holds for us as a nation or for families or as a city any more than anyone else does. But here's what I know. Although life is uncertain, God is not. And he still has the whole world in his hands. That even though life is uncertain, God is not. And he still has your world in his hands. And regardless of what we see or don't see, 
we have the opportunity to embrace a faithful, faithful God, even through circumstances where it is very difficult or maybe impossible to see his hand or to catch a glimpse of his faith because God is still in control. God is still on his throne. God is still a God we can worship with abandon and God is a God that we can continue to trust. That even though our lives are uncertain, he's not. He still has our whole world in his hands. Well, that was Andy Stanley and you can find that clip on YouTube if you search under Andy Stanley One Prayer. You can also find out more information about him at his church website, northpoint.org. That is all I have for you today. I hope you have an amazing day today, and I will see you tomorrow. God bless.